So in our last screencast, we ended it here um, with Trajan's column for Roman sculpture. And as we move forward, this is kind of the, the bridge between Roman sculpture and Roman architecture. And that's because I had already mentioned that Trajan's col column was um, part of an entire complex. And so we're kind of going to use that image to transition now from Roman sculpture into Roman architecture. So this is uh, image 45, and these are parts of that complex. Um, the title is called Trajan's Forum, and we actually have a credible um, architect now. And so uh, the person that is responsible for designing and constructing the forum is Apollodorus of Damascus. It's from 112 CE and located in Rome. And these are your images um, that go with Trajan's forum. Um, the top image here is an interior picture of the basilica. Um, this is an exterior photo of Trajan's markets. Then we have the column that we've already covered. And then we have the forum, this big kind of open arena. Um, it's, I think, important to understand kind of that aerial perspective and, and looking at the entire complex and how they um, kind of are, are laid and work together. And remember, what we have today, you know, are ruins, remnants. So these are kind of, you know, remodels of um, what the entire complex would have looked like within the city center. Um, so right here, this big open forum, um, that is that is the, the forum. And so this um, is, you know, an open area for, for gathering, for events. Um, and you can tell that it is surrounded um, by a colonnade as well. And then at one end of the forum, you have this long building, and that is a basilica, and it's titled the Basilica Ulpia. Okay. Um, over here, where you have a lot of these kind of half circles and curves, this is Trajan's market area. Okay. Um, back here, this is the temple of Trajan. And then right here, number two, right here behind the basilica, this is Trajan's column. And when we were talking about Trajan's column, we talked about, you know, how do you view it? How do you look at the narrative, you know, on such a tall, um, you know, piece of kind of architecture and, and appreciate it and read it and, you know, under be able to follow the story. So we talked about, about flanking each side of the column were the libraries. Well, here are the libraries. And so again, there's some sort of theory that there was some sort of balcony or something on the libraries that allowed you access to view the column um, from kind of all levels. Um, and so that's the um, basic structure of the entire forum. Here I've just included uh, more images, you know, to help show you and help um, appreciate kind of structurally what we're looking at. This is a side perspective of the basilica. So you can see that, you know, there's multiple levels. There's kind of these rounded um, parts to the um, basilica on each end. Um, showing you this is the entrance and um, to, to Trajan's Forum. So you can see how massive the entrance is, the gate inward with all of the kind of relief sculptures. Um, and then this is an interior view of Trajan's markets. Um, a lot of rounded um, kind of uh, arches that we will be discussing um, structurally what, what all of this is about. And then there's the exterior of the markets. So in the Google Slides, um, not in the screencast, I am requiring you to view these two videos. Um, I have one video on this slide, which is the Forum of Trajan, okay? 
and then the video on the next slide is Trajan's Markets. Um, it is through Khan Academy. You need to view them not just for the information, but they actually walk you around the entire complex, the ruins, and there's no other way to kind of three-dimensionally appreciate um, this entire complex. It also shows you the relationship of the ruins with modern day Rome and you know what what happens when these ruins, you know, you build up around it, you build up over it. So it also converses about um, you know how it looks in the contemporary setting opposed to how it looked back in the day when it was constructed. Um, but mostly, especially the markets, you're, you're not going to be able to understand the grandness of it from a two-dimensional photo. So watch these videos. Um, it's, it's required, and it will give you the best understanding um, that you can get. But from um, my slides, I'm just going to go over some main points with you that you need to um, take away for College Board. So again, we have you know an actual name of an architect who is responsible, uh, who was hired to um, design and construct the form of Trajan. So we have Apollodorus of Damascus. Um, like I said, the complex includes the basilica, the markets, the column, the libraries, the temple, and then the open form era, um, area. So historically, this entire um, you know, Trajan Forum was um, was built using the booty, which is another term for, for the funds that he collected after defeating the Dacian. So, um, you know, that was a, a big triumph that um, Trajan led um, over the Dacian War and was successful. And then, you know, after um, defeating the Dacians, you know, the Dacians basically had to pay fines per se, and then Trajan used that money to build this entire complex, okay? Um, we talked about the forum that is flanked by um, colonnades and peristyles, um, and so those buildings that are kind of attached, uh, remember if you look here, um, these long buildings, those are stoa buildings, and then on the interior space, you have colonnades and peristyles, okay? Um, right here in the center, this little dot, originally that was a, a monument. Uh, it was an equestrian monument right in the middle of the forum. It, it's no longer there, but originally um, that, that was placed right in the center. The basilica is absolutely humongous. It is an, a lovely grand interior space of 300 feet long by 182 feet wide. And this is uh, an interior picture of what is called a nave. This is not the interior of the basilica itself. Here is a rendering of the interior of the basilica. But what a uh, vocabulary term you need to know is a nave. And boy, are we going to start talking about naves quite a bit in our next content area. But the nave is the open, wide, spacious um, part of a, of a building. And um, the nave is then um, flanked with a double colonnade here in this particular basilica. So you can see that there is a colonnade right here. And then if you go left, there's a, another colonnade. It is a lot like if you think back to Greece. And we have, um, you know, a, a lot of these interior naves with double, you know, interior colonnades. And then we'll even have a colonnade on the exterior with a peristyle as well. So you can definitely see that Greek influence, um, but we are really looking at things on a bit of a grander scale, okay? Um, it does have a timber roof, and the roof is um, extends 80 feet across. The, the function of the basilica was court, basically. Law courts were held there and a lot of um, government meetings and, and government proceedings. So kind of looked at as a government building. Um, 
It is titled after um, the Trajan family name, which is Ulpia. So that is why it's called the Basilica Ulpia. Um, moving into the markets, the markets were amazing. I mean, it's literally a mall. It's, it's literally a shopping complex and originally had over 150 shops. Um, it's multi-level and it's this gorgeous like semicircular design um, that showcases a wonderful, amazing um, in innovation and in architecture called groin vaulted ceilings. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So we're going to pause and, and address some of these Roman innovations with um, architecture. Really important um, to remember these things and to credit the Romans with this. Um, again, it's going to lead us a lot into our next content area where we um, start with kind of, um, you know, ancient and antique and that we're going to start looking at our early like Christian um, churches and buildings. And so you're going to see a lot of this kind of Roman architecture bleed over into those structures. To begin, we definitely need to give the Romans uh, a lot of engineering credit. Um, they are known for having built many roads and aqueducts that are, connect the empire. So again, we talked about that Roman empire really expanding. And you know, as your empire expands, you need to find ways to keep everything connected, you know, to keep it unified. And the Romans were great about building roads and structures and aqueducts and, and um, really kind of unifying their expansion. Um, the Romans are known for perfecting the arch. Okay, so architecturally, that kind of curved entrance, the arch. And that opposed to the whole like post and lintel system. So if you think about it thus far, we've been really looking at that post and lintel where you have, you know, your your doorway structures or you have your um, your buildings that are, you know, walls and flat roofs. Um, you have, you know, your your two vertical um, posts and then a horizontal crossing. The Romans started to kind of work with you know, well, let's make that curved. And what that did architecturally is um, change not only the way that things look and appear, but structurally how they behave. And then also altered a lot of the materials that they were then able to start working with, okay? One of the ways that they worked with the arch is an example up here, which is called Ashler Masonry. And Ashler Masonry is fantastic because you have a very strong support system, but without having to use mortar. So thinking back to the Egyptians and the building of the pyramids and how they kind of had to use like a mortar system in between all of the stones, Ashler masonry means that the stones fit together in such a way that they support each other without any sort of, um, without any sort of you know, medium that has to go in between them, okay? The Romans are also known for, and this is really what you're gonna get out of those Trajan markets and some other structures that we're about to look at, but they're known for their barrel vault, okay? And then the the concept of the barrel vault then is um, expanded into the groin vault. So over here on the left, I have examples. The barrel vault is the one at the top. So right here, it's just this curved archway. So you would see that at entrances and at gateways, um, you know, uh, hallways and, and things like that. It's just, it's a single kind of arch. But then from that morphed the concept of the groin vault. And so the groin vault is taking two barrel vaults and intersecting them together. And what happens when you start to do that is instead of having this kind of enclosed, narrow, like hallway space, you now have space that's opening up in all directions. OK, so the like the Basilica, for example, you know, kind of has that barrel vault um, element to it. But then the, the markets 
start to expand the direction of their space by groin bolting and putting these two um, together. Okay. The third um, vocab like architectural vocabulary term I want you to be familiar with, and also as a as a credited innovation to uh, the Romans, is the use of the atriums. Um, this is part of the House of Veti that we're going to be looking at, you know, as an architectural piece now. Um, but these were used more within, um, you know, the homes, not necessarily within the public spaces, but they were a way um, to allow light um, to come into, you know, interior spaces. And so we're going to definitely look at the, um, the invention of the atrium. So on that note, that brings us to the House of Veti. And um, again, we've already been here, but in order to look at the frescoes on the um, reception room and specifically um, the um, Pentheus painting, um, now we're going to look at it as a structure, as an architectural structure. So the House of Veti was built in the second century um, BCE. It was then rebuilt in 67 to 79 CE. We're looking at stone um, and fresco, and this is located in Pompeii. And what is very important to understand about this image, what College Board wants you to understand, honestly, is the use of the atriums um, in this kind of floor plan. So if we look at this floor plan, um, you know, we don't need to know every single room and nook and cranny, just, just some of the important ones. But the first thing you want to take note of is this rectangle right here represents um, the large exterior garden, okay? It is considered an atrium because, um, you know, it's still uh, an interior space per se, um, but the difference is that two of the walls that go around uh, this garden, they're, they're just um, garden walls, okay? They're, they're not... Um, they're not walls that go into more interior space. So this is considered more of like a garden area. Um, you have your colonnade that surrounds it, and then all of this white space around it, that's a peristyle, okay? Now on these two sides of the peristyle, then you have the home, okay, that, that surrounds it. And so it's kind of what they want you, you know, to be familiar with. So all of these interior spaces um, are part of the home. And um, what you need to know most is this square right here in the center. This is an actual official atrium. There's also a smaller one right here in this space, another atrium. And, and this is uh, more so what College Board wants you to understand as like an, an architectural design. So the atrium is pretty much a hole in the ceiling, okay? And um, it, it allows light to come into these interior spaces. Because if you look at these spaces, okay, there are no windows, all right? Windows was not something, uh, exterior windows, okay, was not a, a common um, design element. But also, you, you, don't, you just don't always have rooms that could have an exterior window because there's so many interior rooms that, um, you know, you can't put a window in. And so they went ahead and kind of did these windows in the ceiling. So this is an example right here, right below it, of this atrium. This belongs to this, okay? So what you have here... Uh, uh, is the atrium so this is the opening in the ceiling imagine that gone and look at the walls look at how dark it would be inside we get some light from the garden okay but from above and once you're actually like inside the space it becomes so dark so quickly so by adding the atrium not only do you bring light to you know the depth of an interior space but look what is below it, okay? This below it is, you know, like a little, a little 
pool, a little um, kind of basin of water. Well, that is where the rainwater would collect, and then that would become water that they use in their home. So it served a lot of very useful purposes and was an absolutely great innovation of design. This image right here is the outside garden. Okay, so you can, uh, standing in the outside garden, you can kind of see the peristyle around it and then knowing that, you know, the rooms were behind those walls. This is um, kind of what the House of Veti would have looked like in its original days. Um, so you have these beautiful, you know, marble floors, these painted white columns, you know, very high ceilings. But all of those interior walls would have been treated fresco style. And again, you have that Pompeian style where, you know, they are, um, they are kind of showing like faux architectural um, qualities. You know, you have um, paintings that look more like, you know, molding and, and additional columns and addic additional architectural design. Um, and then you have um, little framings of, you know, portraits or mythological stories um, painted on the walls as well to look like hung, um, hung pictures, hung artwork. Okay. And then the light from this room definitely is coming from above and then a little bit through your peristyles outside. So the history of this piece is basically um, it was originally built by two brothers. Um, they're the ones who built the house and owned the house and they were both freedmen and that is literally how it sounds. They were once um, slaves that were then uh, freed and uh, eventually made their money as merchants. Um, you can see that this is, these houses, these homes were, you know, in city centers and were sandwiched between other, other buildings and other shops. Okay, so we're not looking at really like a freestanding structure out in the middle of the countryside that surrounding the edges of this building, of this home, are other buildings, okay? So we talked about not being able to have windows. So if you can imagine, this is the front entrance. So on the right and the left of the House of Vetti are, are other buildings that are connected to it. And so there's, there's no way to have windows when, you know, all these walls are connected to other buildings, okay? So that was another, you know, reason why they had to get light in a, a different way. Um, again, we have the um, large atrium with a catch basin um, in the center, and um, you have that peristyle garden, and we talked about the lack of windows. That's basically um, the information that you need for the House of Veti. Um, I've just found some great other um, drawings and renditions of the House of Vetti that I, I think just helps you understand more what you're looking at. So this is kind of an aerial perspective. So we talked about um, this is the garden and the peristyle um, that comes around it. And then on the other two sides is the actual home, the rooms, the structure. Um, this is the dining room. This is the receipt, the reception room. So this is where um, the frescoes were and the, you know, painting of um, Pantheus was located right here, okay? This is the front entrance. You can see the, the use of windows are minimal, okay? This, okay, they took the roof off so you could see inside. But imagine, you know, there is a roof that goes over here, and this is that room that we just looked at with the atrium that has the water basin below it. Okay, our next image, um, this is the Colosseum. It was built in 72 to 80 CE, and here's a big innovation, guys. It's stone and concrete, okay? Concrete was used a little bit in Trajan markets. 
And again, you will, uh, by watching the videos, you will learn more about that. But concrete is a material innovation by the Romans. And the only reason concrete was able to start being used was because of that groin vaulted um, innovation. Okay, the Colosseum is located in Rome. And uh, in terms of size, the Colosseum was built to hold 50,000 spectators. Um, the original name was not the Colosseum, it was the Flavian Amphitheater. It's an enormous building that has 76 entrances and exits that circle the entire facade. So, um, all the way around, all of these archways circle the entire um, structure and they're all entrances. It's built with a concrete core. So the actual structure of it is concrete, but then on the exterior kind of covering the concrete is a brick casting and a travertine facing. Facing is another way to say facade. Travertine is a stone. Uh, they're stone slabs. So that's that's the structure of it. You have a core of concrete. That's really the structure. And then you have a facade of travertine stone, which is what gives it its look. It's that's more for decorative purposes. That's not for structural. Okay. You have here for the structure an interplay of barrel vaults and groin vaults and arches. So again, this, this is the Romans at their um, architectural engineering best. This is what they were known for, uh, working with the arches, incorporating concrete, using this new groin vaulting system to create uh, larger you know, open interior spaces. Um, this is really what you need to take away from the Romans. We know that the Romans were inspired by the Greeks. They adopted a lot of uh, a lot from the Greeks, like in terms of columns and capitals. But this is how the Romans advanced and moved forward. Okay? The facade has what's called engaged columns. We all know what a column is. We all knew, you know, the Greek order. Um, of the columns. We know that that oftentimes they're used structurally to, to provide support for the roof. What you need to know now is that the Romans started working with what's called an engaged column, okay? So it's a column that is not freestanding. Um, so you can see in between these arches, we still have that column, but it is attached to the arch system. So they're not freestanding. You cannot walk around them, okay? Um, so that's really important to understand the term engaged column. The other remarkable thing about the Colosseum is its order, okay? They have combined and blended multiple orders. On the first level, you have that Tuscan capital. Remember, that is the Roman adaptation of a capital, okay? Then in the middle, you have um, the Ionic. The Ionic is um, with the scrolls, you know, definitely adopted from Greece. And then in that third story, you have the Corinthian. Um, the Corinthian was you know, started in Greece, but then the Romans really, you know, kind of took off with it. And it seems to kind of be the capital that, that they utilize the most. Um, but remember that Tuscan capital also, Tuscany uh, comes from the Etruscan, uh, which was right before Rome. So you really have this blending of three kind of cultures here. Um, and you know, whether that's to pay homage or whether that was just a, a decorative design cho choice, we're not sure, but it's definitely important to take note of, okay? Um, you have up here this story, very, very small windows at the top. Um, they were used to hold um, flagstaffs, which were anchors for a retractable canvas roof. 
And I think a lot of people don't know that about the Colosseum. So back when the Colosseum, you know, was being utilized, it actually had a canvas roof. And these windows were like anchor systems. You know, if, if you could literally picture the concept of an anchor that um, would, you know, go through uh, that hole and then, you know, anchor itself up against the wall. Um, so I think that that's really amazing. A lot of people don't know that, that they would use uh, this retractable canvas roof for uh, to protect the crowds on extremely hot days or from other forms of weather. Um, we do know that the in, in the Middle Ages, that facade of that travertine um, um, facing was pulled off during the Middle Ages. So when we look at the Colosseum today, you don't have that stone um, facade. You don't have the travertine up there anymore you're just kind of exposed to that um, concrete and, and uh, brick casting. Here are just some more images um, of the Colosseum to help you understand its grandness, first of all, its, its size, its all of the multiple levels, um, and just the enormous um, structure that was built. Um, by the Romans. And over here on the left, I tried to include a picture that um, has people in it, tourists, um, because I, I definitely want to give you an understanding of how big things were, how big the you know actual forum was, how tall the structure was, remembering that you know these were all um, seats uh, for onlookers. And, you know, you had some covered seating back here and then tried to picture, you know, these windows with this big canvas roof that would stretch across. It's just absolutely amazing. And again, here we're looking at it in its um, natural state of ruins. Here's just an aerial perspective to just give you another look at it. I think it really helped us see these um, barrel um, barrel arches, these barrel vaults here, the, the size and the depth of them, you know, how deep those barrel vaults went. Um, but it's just an enormous structure. You can also see it in comparison to people and vehicles. Okay, this next um, structure is probably one of my favorites. And so um, I really enjoy talking about this. This is called the Pantheon. It was constructed in 118 to 125 CE. Again, we're looking at that wonderful innovation of concrete. We still have that stone facade. Uh, that's, that's how the Romans dealt with it. The, the concrete brought benefits in, in so many ways, but it was kind of an ugly um, appearance. It was an ugly finish. And so they definitely found ways to cover that and to treat that so it, it could be a, it could look more beautiful. So the Pantheon, um, I think what I enjoy is, is its function, but also its design. Um, the function of it is it was a building that um, was dedicated to all of the gods. So it was a place where you could go and, and pay, give your dedication and pay homage to um, all the Roman gods. Um, this is the front, okay? And then um, the, the front is that kind of classical design, and then you have a rounded structure behind it. Now, continue to think about those Romans, those Romans and working with curves. Think back to the Basilica Ulpia, and that's how the Basilica was flanked, you know, with these rounded um, structures. And think of the markets and all of those semicircle divines. Well, the Pantheon is part of that as well. Okay. So we have the front part that is um, a pediment, a capital porch. You can see the colonnades. I think there's one, two, three, or four rows of colonnades. And this is the front of the building. This is the front entrance. Um, the facade has um, two pediments, um, one that is deeply recessed behind the other. Um, and when you go inside, this is the interior. So behind this kind of domed or behind this rounded structure, 
this is how it looks inside. And so it's hard to tell from the outside, but the, the ceiling of this rounded portion of the building is a dome, okay? And it's, it's hard to see that from the outside. So in this rounded part um, of the structure, then you also have this rounded dome. When you look at the dome, you have these kind of um, squares, these repeated squares. That is called a coffered ceiling. So here's what's amazing. You know, the we've been talking about frescoes and how they are there to serve the purpose to kind of um, give the the appearance of um, architectural further architectural design on just plain walls. Well, please don't be fooled. This is not painted. These are actually three dimensional sunken panels into the ceiling. Um, and so because they're they are actual, you know, uh, three dimensional architectural designs, this is what's called a coffered ceiling. And it contrasts, which is so lovely because it's just this repetition of these squares, this geometry contrasts so nicely with all of the curves that happen in this Roman building. The dome, the roundedness of the walls, you even see some arches, um, you know, in between the columns and back within these niches. So it's just a great um, contrast of shape, okay? Um, the dome is called the cupola, and the walls of the cupola are extremely thick, 20 feet at the base, okay? So at the base of this dome, we're talking 20 feet thick, and as it goes upward, it does thin out a little bit. You can kind of see the thickness up at the top, um, but extremely thick. This is my favorite part of this building is this opening up at the top. So again, I want you to, you know, bring it all together, the Romans and their architectures and what they're known for. We just got done talking about the atrium, talking about the opening, you know, at the House of Betty. This is the same concept, except it's circular, it's rounded. So it does serve a little bit different of a purpose, okay? Yes, it definitely allows light to come in, but when it's rounded like this, it is called an oculus. You will need to know that, okay? So this is an oculus. It is huge though. I know from the picture, it maybe looks like it's about four feet wide. No, it's 27 feet across, okay? So it's a huge opening in the ceiling. It's a literal opening. There is no glass. It is not a window, okay? It's a literal opening. Yes, rain falls in. The, um, <clears throat> the interior structure is designed to accept the rain that falls in and the floors have like a drainage system so that you know rain collects, but it kind of pools away into the drains and the water is taken away, okay? But here is what the oculus is for, and here is, is how a rounded opening differs from a, a you know, rectangular or squared opening. And here is how it interacts with this building. All the reasons why I love it so much. This oculus collects sunlight, okay, but in a circular form, almost like a spotlight, okay? And if you think about how the sun, you know, travels, it takes that spotlight and as, you know, the sun moves, you know, southward throughout the day, the spotlight moves around the interior space. And here's an a, even more amazing extension of that. The interior space is surrounded by these niches. These niches, a niche is basically just kind of like a carved away, um, sunken spot in the wall. These niches is what houses sculptures of all the gods. So throughout the day, this natural spotlight hits each one of these sculptures of the gods and 
highlights them for a period of time and it just continues to move around the room hitting each one um, of these sculptures of the gods and to me that that is just amazing of how uh, first of all you know the innovation and the engineering but how art and architecture is working with nature um, and that's just something that I really respect and think is just a, a beautiful aspect of this building. Um, the Another interesting thing is the height of this building is equal to the width of this building. So, so even though you've got this rounded wall, you're, you're working with kind of this structure that is almost, you know, like a perfect cube, okay? We talked about the niches. The walls have seven niches um, that house the statues of the gods. Again, this is, um, you know, because of groin vaulting, the concept of groin vaulting, we're able to have this open dome in the interior made of concrete. Um, another interesting fact, if you look at the exterior, modern day exterior of the Pantheon, um, you can see that the, the road is like pretty much level with it, but this is only because throughout the course of time, the city of Rome, like most cities, have been elevated, you know, when they start putting in you know, sewer systems and things like that. Most urban areas, uh, ancient urban areas, have had to have been elevated. And so that same thing happened here. So picture this, though, in its original day, that this was originally built on a very high podium. You know, think back to like the um, House of Minerva, the Etruscan temple that had that very high podium. This, that's kind of what you would have seen here as well. And I like ending it on one of my um, most, you know, favorite architectural pieces. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it as well and found some interesting things and learned a lot about Roman architecture because it's going to definitely um, lead us into our next content area, uh, which is just around the corner.